It's good to see everybody that's, that's made it out this evening. Um, we're going to be continuing our Old Testament study, as you can tell. And uh, real quickly, we'll go through this, this left-handed outline and uh, just give you a rundown of what we're going to be looking at this evening. So of course, the title is The Branch of Rich Righteousness. You'll understand that as we read the text. I'm sure most, many of you probably already do. Um, but it's going to be taken from Jeremiah 23, verses 1 through 8. Um, first point here, uh, Jeremiah, uh, this is God actually uh, speaking here, but he's uh, comparing uh, Israel and its leaders to sheep and shepherds. We're going to look at that, the judgment of the sheep and the regathering, I'm sorry, the judgment of the shepherds, the regathering of the, of the sheep. Um, and then verses 5 through 6 is going to be talking about a king to come sometime after that. And then there we'll, we'll look at other references to this branch. Uh, the branches reign prophesied. Uh, the, branches, the branches reign in action. And then this verse here, Jeremiah 33 and verse 18. It was just something I felt pretty noteworthy. I feel like something I missed a lot as I was studying this. Not overly rel related to this, but it is in fact. Um, and then the, the last verses of this section is verse 7 through 8. It's, it's a comparison of, of these events to the Exodus. So uh, to begin, let's go ahead and read there. Jeremiah 23 verses 1 through 8. There it says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you. For the evil of your doing, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all of the countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their land. So... Just a quick background, I know, uh, tr I believe Brother Trevor covered, did an overview of Jeremiah. Just a couple little points real quick. Jeremiah lived during the time of the um, Judah alone time period after Israel had already been taken captive. He lived while uh, Judah was still standing on its own there during the last few kings all the way into the captivity of Judah. Um, he began his work during the reign of King Josiah, uh, which was the the uh, last good king that, that Judah had. And from that point on, it was a, just a, uh, a downward spiral there until the captivity. Um, Jeremiah was not taken into Babylon, where, of course, they were taken captive. He actually was eventually taken to Egypt, where he died there. And uh, the time frame of this chapter would still have been before the, uh, before the onset of the captivity. I don't know a, a specific date to give you for real good reference, but it would be before the actual captivity here. So um, back to the, uh, the first point there, the, the sheep and the shepherd comparison here. Let's go ahead and read that again, just verses 1 through 2. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doing, says the Lord. So God is passing judgment to the shepherds of Israel, um, these being the, the leaders, the kings, the priests, um, those who are in authority over the people and those who are to be the shepherds of the people. So I think we all understand what the role of a shepherd is. It's to feed, to, uh, to protect, to water, to, to guide, to mend, to, uh, to keep together the flock and attend to the flock for its well-being. And uh, the leaders of Israel are being accused of God for the exact opposite of that. Um, he used the words what they were doing. They were destroying and scattering the people, and they were not attending to them. And uh, I'd like to read Ezekiel 34, if you would turn over there. Not the whole chapter. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. But it gives a more descriptive picture of the same scene here, specifically in using the imagery of, of sheep and shepherds. 
And Ezekiel, he is a uh, contemporary, a little bit later than Jeremiah, but another prophet here who was, um, would have been alive during the, uh, the exile into Babylon and into the Babylonian captivity. But uh, here he is prophesying this very same thing, starting there at Ezekiel 34, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. So of course the, the scattering here he's talking about is to the, the captivity. All the way back to uh, uh, De De Deuteronomy and even earlier probably, um, we see consequences laid out for Israel when they when they sinned against God and when they when they broke the covenant. And captivity was was one of the ones um, very clearly laid out and described. And uh, being taken captive by the other nations, um, God gave Judah over specifically to Babylon, but it was their own actions that got them there. Um, and how they got there was wicked kings, corrupt priests, and lying prophets. That was all the, the downfall of the nation. Now, the people were led astray for following the examples that were, that were so poorly set before them. Now, of course, everyone's going to be judged by their own actions. Everybody has choice. But there is very specific um, consequences to those of a leadership role in this time for, for being that poor example out in front that rubbed off on the whole nation to the point where the common man was just a wicked person in, in Judah at this time. So the shepherds were more often wolves in sheep's clothing than, than true shepherds. And uh, they were, of course, led astray by the, the examples that were set before them. And back to verse 2. It says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. So God is going to deal with these uh, evil shepherds. Now let's look at uh, verses 3 and 4. The point B here, regathering of the flock. God then turns, turns his attention back to the sheep instead of the shepherds there. He says, But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. So this is uh, alluding to the, uh, the remnant of Judah that would return after the Babylonian captivity uh, during the Persian reign, I believe. So uh, Judah will, will go into Babyl Babylonian captivity around 586 B.C. And uh, Babylon will fall to the Persian Empire uh, around 539 B.C. And at 538, Cyrus, the king of Persia, begins to let uh, some, of, some, of, some of the tribe of Judah to go back to Jerusalem and to begin to uh, rebuild the temple and to rebuild Jerusalem there. And it says, During this time, God will set up shepherds over the people who will feed them, and they shall not be lacking. Um, some of those shepherds would include uh, Zerubbabel, um, Nehemiah, were familiar with those who served as governors, and also the priesthood was reestablished during that time period. So I think we see evidence of that coming into play. And this is the, and that would have been the, the return the, with the final uh, biblical period that, you know, we write all these 14 biblical periods of the Old Testament through. That would be the return in that time period. So now let's go on to the, to the next point there, a king to come. Um, we'll read Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through 6. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. So after this remnant is established um, at a later date, God makes this statement that this is going to take place. He will raise a, a, to David a branch of righteousness. This word branch means a shoot, a sprout, or a bud. 
Um, and from the line, so basically what that's saying is from, the, from David's ancestral line, this king would come. And this branch will be a king and see his reign, and we will see his reign described as what we see here in these verses. And before we go into that further, I'd like to read two other accounts of this uh, parallel or the same prophecy here. Um, in Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 18, it's basically a restatement of this, this promise. And then we'll also look at Isaiah 11, 1 through 12. But starting there, at Jeremiah 33 and 14, this will sound pretty familiar. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will, call, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she, she will be called the Lord, our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Nor shall the, prop, nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me, to kindle grain offerings, and to sacrifice continually. Now we'll come back to verse 18 specifically a little bit later. But let's go ahead and look at uh, Isaiah 11 verses 1 through 12. You wanna, we're going to read that entire reading there. So keep in mind those, those words that we're seeing in those righteousness, uh, judgment, um, a branch, a rod, um, peace, rest for the people, a, being re a reunion, all these things we see common to all three of these passages here. So Isaiah 11 verses 1 through 12. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not, be, and he shall not judge by, his, by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness, the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and fatling together, and a little child and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. The young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters that cover the sea. And in that day shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place will be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that they shall set, set his hand against again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. I hope we can see there the, the, the similarities between those three groups of verses. It's all referring to this, this same prophecy here. Six things specifically um, that we can see are these that I have over here. The kingdom, it, we can clearly see that he, he's going to reign as a king this branch. In spite of all the current situation of imminent um, captivity, um, it says that he was going to, to reign on David's throne. Um, the next thing there, uh, prosperity. It talked of how his reign would prosper. Um, and the word prosper used back in uh, verse 5 of Jeremiah 23 means with, to rule, basically to rule with, with high intellect, wisdom, success, understanding, and expertly would be the, the characteristics of his reign and how it would go. Um, the third point I think we see reoccurring in all these is justice and righteousness. That, those two words are, are used a lot there. He will judge his people in doing so. He will be righteous in his judgments. Isaiah 11, 3 and 4 says, His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. 
and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. This was a quote I thought was kind of helpful uh, from James Smith, what the Bible teaches about the promised Messiah, his book. Um, if any distinction is to be made between justice and righteousness, it is this justice views the conduct from the standpoint of man and righteousness from the standpoint of God. Thus, the man who executes justice and righteousness is seen by man absolutely equitable and by God to be upright. And then the, the fourth point here is that there's going to unite Judah and Israel. Um, these two having been split apart due to their own choices and their own differences. Uh, will be reunited during the reign of this branch. The fifth point we see is deliverance. It says clearly that Judah will be saved. Um, the sixth point there, some of these are two at a time, but security and rest, they kind of go hand in hand. It says that Israel will dwell safely. And uh, Isaiah 11, 6 through 10 very clearly paints a picture of that. Um, there it says, the wolf... Also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters that cover the sea." And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place will be glorious. From all those descriptions there, I think that's what you can pull from it is security and uh, peace. So now we're going to look at um, these same, same things in the uh, fulfillment side. What I have over here is just a column across and New Testament references here. And a spoiler alert, this branch is talking about Christ. And I think we all will get that. I just haven't said it yet. But uh, we'll, we'll go through these same things, talk about the kingdom, uh, the prosperity of His reign, justice and righteousness, how He's going to unite Judah and Israel, the deliverance and the security and rest that we have in Christ. Um, the first one there, Luke 1, verses 30 through 33, talking about the, the reign of Jesus' kingdom. This is an angel talking to Mary here before she is uh, gives birth to Jesus in Luke 1, 30. It says, Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. There it is. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So I think that kind of links that together fairly, fairly clearly. Of course, prosperity um, with intellect, wisdom, success, understanding, expertly, Christ uh, rules the kingdom. I don't really have a good specific verse to that, but 1 Corinthians 15, 24, and 25, we can see that um, all things are in Christ's authority from that. He is ruling and He is, he is over everything. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then comes the end when He delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when He puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. For He must reign till He has put all enemies under His feet. Point number three, justice and righteousness. Um, Jesus, Jesus satisfies uh, God's requirement for justice um, that required the perfect sacrifice of Himself for us who, who are sinful and imperfect and unrighteous before God. He is our righteousness. That was the title given to Him in verse 6. Um, the title given to the branch, the Lord our righteousness. We see that in Romans 5 verse 19. Um, talking about Jesus there. For it's through one man's disobedience that many were made sinners. Referring to Adam in that statement. Now Christ, even so through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteousness. Will be made righteous. Also 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. So I hope we see that there. Um, moving, I know, moving rather quickly from point to point here. But now the, the fourth point uh, uniting Judah and Israel. How do we see that fulfilled in the New Testament? Uh, Galatians 3 26 through 29, I think, clearly. Clearly evidence is that um, Galatians 3, starting at verse 26. 
For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were, as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham, Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So being brought into Jesus' kingdom, I think we do see how Israel and Judah can be reunited. They are brought together in a common union of Christ, as well as the Gentiles, us who were, who were not born Jews, are all brought into to one group now, and we're all under Christ. Next point, deliverance. Uh, Matthew 1, 20-21. There it says, but, wh but while he thought about these things, uh, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take your... To take to you marry your wife for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins so the deliverance that um, that we see here is not is not a deliverance from from oppressive government it's a deliverance from sin and that's what we as you look through every one of these you'll start seeing um, what maybe seems like uh, physical physical attributes talked about in the uh, in the verses in Jeremiah. Pretty much every one of these in the New Testament, they're not physical; they're spiritual. It's a different realm that he's referring to. So, when maybe you know, as put yourself in their shoes, I guess what I'm trying to say is, when they're looking for Christ, they're looking for things differently than what what we're talking about right now. They're looking for a literal kingdom. They're looking for David's uh, David's chair to be set back up somewhere and him to sit in it and to be a king over a real people and a real land and a real nation um, and have all of that real prosperity, justice and righteousness governing the earth and uh, the literal reunion of, reuniting of, of Judah and Israel. But all of these things in the... Uh, in the New Testament, in the in the New Covenant, in the New Kingdom, are not are not physical, but they're spiritual. Forgot where I was now. Okay, last last point there: security and rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight through thirty, Jesus says, "Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light." And we're not promised physical security and rest, uh, but in Christ we have rest of our souls. We have the peace of mind knowing that we can face trouble. We can go through hard times knowing that we can be at rest in Christ and that we can, we can go even to the grave with, with hope knowing that uh, we have more, more to life than this when it's over. So that's, that's uh, what I have for all of that. Now I would like to go back to, like I said, Jeremiah 33, verse 18. I think it's a, an interesting thing that I, the first time I read this and the first few times I read this, I, I scratched my head about it a bit. But as I got to studying this, uh, someone smarter than myself pointed it out and uh, it makes a lot of sense. So uh, starting there, Jeremiah 33, verse 17. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And then here's the, the verse I want to focus on. Nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me, to kindle grain offerings, and to sacrifice continually. So all those verses were talking about the reign of the branch. And we recognize that his reign is, is eternal. It's continual. And when, we, when I see that about the Levites, I'm, it kind of it made me kind of trip on it a couple times. Um, but to help understand that, um, a couple points I've already brought up now but need to be reiterated is we're talking here, physical descriptions of a spiritual kingdom. Um, the reign of the branch is spiritual and it's not physical. The church, you know, we often refer to it as spiritual Israel. Talk about it that way. And Israel is a, is a foreshadow of the church. And uh, with those things in mind, let's, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 5. 
lot of turning, so I'm going to wait. So what I'm getting at is, is of course, who is this referring to and why don't we see the Levite, Levites or anything? Is this some kind of fallacy? Um, what do we understand about this? But I think this will clearly explain it. First Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 5. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now skip on down to verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. You may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of the darkness into His marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now a people, but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So the Levit the Levitical priesthood is really a foreshadowing of us. We are the priesthood in the in the new Te in the New Testament, of course. Jesus being the ultimate, our high priest, we are the, the priests under him who, who uh, figuratively offer uh, grain and burnt offerings, but our, our offerings are spiritual sacrifices, as it says there in uh, 1 Peter. So I just thought that, that was interesting to me. Maybe it's not to you. Maybe you already understood that, but I didn't. So you had to hear it. Um, now the, the final part of our, our study here is the, the comparison made to the, the exodus of Egypt. Um, verses 7 and 8 says, back to Jeremiah 23, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. So, a comparison of the exodus from Egypt is being made to the uh, um, restoration of Israel here. Um, Israel remembered it, of course, recognized the exodus as a very great uh, happening here, in which Israel, of course, left Egypt by the, after the ten plagues God set upon them. And that was a very big deal. It may have been one of the biggest deals in all of the Old Testament was the exodus. It's what established... Israel as a nation. They weren't a nation really until they had left left Israel. They were slaves until they left Israel. So coming out of I keep saying Israel, coming out of Egypt, they uh, that's when they first were established. So of course this was a founding moment to to the nation. And what, what God's saying here is that's no longer gonna be the, the significant um, story. It's gonna be the reuniting of Israel under the reign of the branch. And I hope that that's clear there. So um, God now foretells that the restoration of Israel through the branch of righteousness will be greater uh, than the exodus from Egypt. And that's what he's referring to here. Um, that's what I have prepared for us this evening. I don't have a lot of um, applications. You know, this is a study of a prophecy. And I hope at a minimum that we understand that and uh, that I've been able to adequately enough portray what's going on here. Um. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So, go ahead. Do it. Like right now. Click on it.